Hello everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So today, uh, we're kind of doing the same process that we started last week of getting these kind of rock walls in place. I believe last week I hadn't got any paint on that or anything. So it was very abstracted, just kind of clobbering these kind of rocks in place. Uh, but now I've got um, one side done and now it's going to be the exciting process of applying all of the, um, you know, the experimenting, the, the best results that I got from this side onto this side. Uh, but as always, I'm doing a little bit of work on my diorama textures first. This is one of those projects that just takes many, many, many kind of like little steps. And so I need to make sure that I'm always doing a little bit of the little steps every day to keep progress happening on those. I'm basically mortaring a bunch of little bricks that I've cast already in place. I'm using freeform air about, uh, let's see what our ratio is here. Let's say 90% freeform air to 10% epoxy sculpt. I like mixing these two products together. They're different products from different companies, uh, but they are both kind of in the same family of being epoxies two-part epoxy you know clay essentially <laughs> the freeform air is very light and fluffy and dough like and sticky and the epoxy sculpt is a lot more of a serious substance you got to take it seriously uh, but for a task like mortaring bricks into place uh, I, I only want to take it 10% seriously because I want to be able to easily uh, carve, sand, uh, chip away at um, the results that I have. So I find this is a pretty good ratio, anywhere from like 10 to maybe 30% of the serious stuff, and then the rest of it, the fluffy, sticky stuff. Uh, the serious stuff gives it just enough of, or moderates the stickiness <laughs> and the um, the difficulty of working with a with a very fluffy material uh, just enough that it becomes less of a pain in the butt to work with. Like freeform air is wonderful to work with after it's set and awful to work with before it's set when it's in its very sticky stage. So you can see it's sticking to my gloves a bit, um, but if I didn't put that, that other stuff in there, it would just be like mostly on my hands and only a little bit <laughs> able to work with, so. Uh, all right, so to orient us a little bit to what's going on on our texture here, um, this is, we, we mostly finished this side. I've got a couple, couple tweaks I wanna make to it. But the idea is that this is a tileable texture that you could put on anything, or it will be once it's cast in a, in a resin material. And since I'm going to be making a mold of both sides, and I'm still a little bit on the fence on this, but I, I really like the idea that you could have one side that's kind of a cleaner, newer one, and then one side that's all beat up to hell and, you know, for battle places or ruins or whatever and so you have the same sheet it just depending on which way you flip it uh, you change change the flavor of it a bit I think that's a neat innovation it does have its drawbacks and and the more that I'm kind of building it out the more I'm thinking about those drawbacks and yeah I still don't know <laughs> I still don't know where I'm gonna land on it I'm gonna need to play around with it a bit uh, that one of the downsides 
to having uh, uh, two sides like this is that it's not optimized for one side, which, because it could be thinner if it was just perfectly flat across here, right? Obviously I'm adding depth by adding another set of tiles on the other side. Um, and I'm just not sure where that fine line is. And it's not going to like stick down perfectly because there are all these different um, elevations. So yeah, I like I said, I'm up in the air about it a little bit. This one is another example of, you know, two different sides, two different flavors. Although this is just a completely different thing. Like this is not even related to this, right? It just so happened that when I thin it out by hollowing out all the, all the high points on this side, that's more or less the sort of thing I ended up with. And I think this can be a very useful texture for many things. It's just, <laughs> it just bothers me that it's in no way related to what's on this side because you have this wonderful dynamic with this kind of texture where it's the same thing, but tweaked. Anyway, yeah, just, just thinking out loud here. If you guys have any strong opinions on a, you know, a direction to go with that, like if you were gonna buy, uh, you know, a couple sheets of these, would you rather have sheets that were completely flat on one side or would you have, have them be a little bit thicker, which means a little bit more expensive, but also um, more option, <laughs> more more choice. Or is it better to just buy two sheets, you know, of, of the kind you want? You know, saying it out loud like that, it's probably better to just buy the two sheets that you really want instead of getting like a bonus texture and having to make a difficult choice about. <laughs> <laughs> about which way to face it. I don't know. I don't know. And so I've gone through, I cast a bunch of the, the bricks and I cast them to size measuring off of my template. So I've got, you know, ones that are this size, ones that are half that size, et cetera, et cetera. I, I made a, a family of them more or less. And then I tried to put the, the cleanest ones on this side. Um, and then the more broken beat up ones on this side. And so as I've been processing them, I've been collecting them in this little bin to keep them organized. sided thing I wonder if maybe it a lot of it depends on who is using the stuff because I'm trying to develop this as a product that people who d don't have sculpting skills or you know that like you know strong art skills can just like buy this and put it on things and make things look, you know, cardboard boxes or uh, uh, cardboard tubes, whatever, right? And make really cool looking stuff. And I'm not, it seems like having two different sides to choose from might be more appealing to them than it would be to serious terrain builders and stuff who like have a very clear, you know, picture in mind. Often, often, sometimes we don't.
see if I can piece this together. Tired of the lo-fi. Can only take so much lo-fi. Perfect. I switched to another lo-fi channel. Problem solved. I think 90% of pretzels libraries and labels are lo-fi. It's not that I don't like lo-fi, it's, it's just that, you know, it only takes so much of a thing.
Um, rubbly, um, grouty texture by jabbing at it with the brush usually works. It's a good little texture I can put on here. Maybe one of these rocks could work well.
This thing keeps popping off when I'm working with it, so I'm going to just preemptively put a brick down there. Preemptive brick, you know, as the old saying goes. Part of your diorama texture keeps popping off. Put a preemptive brick there. Might have originated in Sun Tzu's Art of War. Not sure where the saying comes from. Good.
this guy over here, 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 over here. Now let's mix up a little bit of uh, Mod Podge and paint. I'm gonna do as little paint as possible because I want a very full body on this, but I want enough paint to make it obvious where I put it. So we're gonna play around with that amount. to remove the inner lid. Pro tip from a paint master. Take off the lid before removing paint from your container. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. I still think that's going to be pretty translucent. So I put some um, snow. What is that? I don't know. It's little particles of snow. You know, you get it for basing minis and such. Because uh, I wanted to give this a little bit of a texture. It didn't. It was fairly smooth before, but it had enough imperfections where, you know, uh, some grit will hide all of those instead of me having to fastidiously sand over this over and over again. I did enough sanding of it over and over again. I don't want to do more, so. Um, however, it's a little, it's a little much for me at this point, as far as like how far the little chunks stick up off the surface. So what I'm doing is applying some Mod Podge mixed with paint um, to fill in the areas around the sticky outy bits to make them not sticky outy as muchy. That's the technical artist terminology there.
It's trying to accomplish essentially what I'm doing now with uh, by hitting it with massively thick amount of spray primer and um, just didn't didn't get me there. curious for these ones that are still kind of poking up a little bit. Can I just sort of mash them down at this phase? Pop them off. Actually, I mixed exactly half of what I would need. Perfect. I mean, half perfect. Yeah. This is some old, lumpy, bumpy stuff. gonna require sinus surgery to get rid of this booger. different proportions this time, but I think that's fine.
like I have a little too much in there, so. What I can do is just do the dab and wipe method of fluid extraction. Josh Foreman's Pat did dab and wipe technique on demonstration now. underestimated how well this would spread. And it's really funny, I've, I worked, I don't know how many hours on this stupid texture here. And, um, you know, trying to get every line perfect and smooth and clean and et cetera, et cetera. And as I've gone through the texturing and, and this process now, I'm pretty much obliterating any indication of all that work that I did earlier. It's part of the learning process where it's like when you're not sure exactly what the next step is going to truly accomplish uh, you know I want to overkill and make sure that when I do that step which is now this step um, I'm not going to have to like undo it to go back and do something structural It is what is known in computer graphics as a destructive art pipeline. Non-destructive art pipelines are all the rage and I highly recommend them. That's where when you're like on step eight out of 20 in the process, 
and your art director come comes by and is like, uh, can you change those square bricks to rectangle bricks? You don't have to like scrap steps one through seven and start over again. You can just like go back to step three or four, redefine the shapes, and then because the software is constituted in such a way, it auto updates all the stuff above it. We, it's harder to achieve that sort of thing in real meat space, let me tell ya. I wish I could just tweak some knobs and dials on this and make it change. I probably will be making some textures in the series on the computer um, and then 3D printing them out. But I just want to do the proof of concept by hand for real first and then I'll see how far I can push it on the computer. That's my plan. You know, plans work great until they come into contact. Uh, is it first contact with the enemy? That is a real quote. I can't remember exactly how it goes. Someone tell me how that real quote goes. No plan survives first contact with the enemy? Maybe it's something like that. I don't know who my enemy is when it comes to art. Probably myself. <laughs> okay, I think I've scooped out all the bottom parts that I'm afraid are going to lose their texture. If I scoop them out enough? I don't know. Depends on how much this settles as it dries. And you know, if, if some of the bottoms are less textury than others, that's fine. This is obviously a very organic whatever it is. Lava field, muddy uh, surface, uh, some kind of um, wind-blown desert rock face, uh, the bottom of tide pool, ropey lava. Did I say that one already? Or uh, what's the army in the Witcher TV show that has armor that's all wrinkly? Kind of reminds me of that too. So I'm kind of looking for any place where the highlights are like a long, thin string. Like there, I could see that my, yeah, see that right there? Long, thin string of white highlight. That means that it's smoother than everywhere else. So I'm just gonna try to dab it to break it up. Dab it, dab it, dab. at it from a lot of different angles to find them.
set this to the side. Now it's time to carve some rock. Well, now it's time to clean this brush. Then it's time to carve some rock. Man, in the last garage slash art studio I had, we did not have a sink in there. It's so nice to have a sink in your art workshop. Highly recommend. I'm going to be using it for this. Are uh, mostly this guy. In fact, let's go sharpen him real quick. Much easier when the knife is sharp. of little malady hammers and a collection of textury rocks. Those seem to be my sort of main go-tos for um, the style that I've been working on for this particular rock style. And I think what I'm gonna do is just kind of lay this one down so I've got it. Maybe it's better here. I don't know, we'll see. It's not important where that one is right now, is it? No. What's important is that I can pop this guy out. got this very awkward uh, shape here that hopefully doesn't just snap off. Um, yeah, and a couple places where I'll probably want to fill in some gaps like that, but that's pretty easy and straightforward. Mostly what I want to focus on is getting the flow and the, the shape of the rock faces here. Now I've got this reference that I really like because it's got very similar ruins to the ones that I'm doing and show kind of like how they, you know, erode and fall apart. Um, and then the shapes of rocks, which in this reference are pretty just kind of crinkly. <laughs> it's it's hard to pull out really strong shapes. There's a few, so there's a nice overhang here, which I can obviously use as reference for the overhang I have. Um, and then on this part of it, you can see, you know, here's kind of a triangle shape cutaway, and there's these sort of. You know, so it's I'm basically just looking to pick out those kinds of shapes, and then at the same time, I'm blending this style with this style because I want those very strong striated lines to carry through the carved part because that's going to help sell the illusion that, uh, that that these ruins here were carved out of these rocks here. And 
and when I was doing this first part, I did it very, uh, a lot of um, striations to the point where I think it's a little too much. It's too far away from, from this particular reference that I like so much. Um, so as I was going up, I was trying to figure out ways to have fewer and fewer of those lines and just bolder, larger shapes of rocks as I go up. So that's what I'm going to be working on replicating over here. I'll probably do a similar thing where it starts out more eroded near the bottom and then, you know, but I'll, I'll get to these, uh, these parts that I'm a little happier with sooner on the way up my rock stack. That's the idea. Nilfgaard is the name of the wrinkly armor, guys. Okay, thank you. over here. I should just bring it over. This is where these tools are supposed to live. foam carving caddy so I've got um, most of my knives and cutting stuff in there. I've got my stabby jabby and texture things. This is where my, my rocks go in there. And then like more of the large scale cutting and slicey stuff there. What do I have down here? Oh yeah like stuff I hardly ever use but Sometimes it's useful. <laughs> okay. Put away the knives that I don't use very often. This is how I do the very sort of busy thing. I just go lots of fairly rapid, sloppy slices. I'm not thinking very hard about it at all. Except for I need to go around corners, and I need to think about it a little bit. And I will occasionally do some like cross cutting like that just to keep things a little bit interesting. And I'm gonna kind of stop that process around this part and go into the bigger blockier shapes up there. And then it is often nice to, before you get into more detail, like these slashes are fine for now, but when I start making some definite little shapes in here, you know, this, that makes the striation stop. So I'm going to go in and continue those striations, or at least, you know, select handful of them, enough to get the idea across down in there. So to get these shapes, I'm just, you know, I'm doing the same thing as the slice. I'm just doing it deeper and usually against the grain to some degree. And if I want a particular shape of it, again, I'm, I'm thinking about my reference here and how sometimes the rocks shear in this kind of shape. Sometimes they've got this sort of little V-shaped gap in them. It's a, you know, there's a really fun little overhang there. So I'm looking to recreate that sort of thing. 
So here's a place where I can get a little bit of overhang from this wedge and a V shape under it. So I, I kind of roughly define that and then it's sticking the knife in and twisting. You just pop it out like that. This kind of edge, it's kind of soft there, which is not something I see in, like when the rock breaks away, usually it's a pretty harsh fracture. Um, the older it is, the more it will wear down, but um, still these kind of collapses tend to have a, a harsher profile on them. So I'm trying to get a nice crisp edge to it. And also if there are these striation lines like that, you're gonna see the the breakaway kind of follow those those shapes to some degree. That's another thing I like to do is um, where these two pieces are meeting, there's this little bit of a, of a ledge here, right? And it's kind of unnatural because it's two flat pieces of foam. So one way to ameliorate that unnaturalness is to cut in fairly thin lines and then just kind of pluck them away and you can get a, a more sort of um, a natural rock fractury look that way. But yeah, most of this process is just like jabbing and stabbing and looking for the happy accidents. You know, I, I think that's a pretty nice sort of fractury shape in there. harder to see on the blue because of the brightness of it, I guess. Ah, so see how it broke at a shape like that and that, that, like this little stair-steppy thing? That is something you definitely see in striated rock, so I want to lean into those kind of effects. But these, um, these horizontal lines, they don't have to travel 100% across here because they are, you know, when you think about it in 3D, the way rocks sort of get mashed together and their joints are formed, um, it's not just like a homogenous lasagna where it just like does one layer perfect and then another layer perfect. Things get swirled and mixed together a lot. Um, so. There are counterexamples. There, there are some, you know, geological phenomenon, certain kinds of seasonal flooding and stuff on shallow seas where you will get like super homogenous lines. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, famous canyons. The Grand Canyon is a good example. Bryce Canyon is another one where it is very consistent uh, the lines, but. Uh, that's not the reference that I'm trying to go off of for this. That's another case where I've got sort of a flat piece of foam there. And so to address that, you know, cut the chip and flick technique. Do that a couple different, a couple times to kind of step it and round it out. 
uh, still in an angular way. It, it sounds weird to say you're rounding it angularly, but that is kind of what's happening. I'm pretty sure all of this is like behind it, the first um, uh, shelf. So it's going to be all hidden back here, this particular part that I'm working on. So I, I want to be careful not to get too caught up in making a bunch of details that literally cannot be seen from any angle, you know. What I could do is mark those out a little better. Let me do that. Let's do a little time-saving exercise, shall we? So, uh, this shelf is here. More or less. This whole area, like, kind of see it in there. Uh, you will be able to see some of it, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty hidden. And same with this area down here. So I'm going to just kind of indicate that by drawing lines out. And then up here, this one, this one's very obvious because it's like a very clear notch. another way to get nice flat-ish faces that aren't like factory flat 
just to just cut as thin a slice as possible and flick your knife out. Uh, I just break. Mostly blocked off. Probably gonna come back to this area a little bit later, but I want to kind of move up to where I'm trying to do these bigger features. So that's the part that's still pretty tricky for me to pull off for whatever reason. It's a lot easier to just go slash 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 flick 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 than it is to think compositionally especially reproducing stuff that is very ambiguous hard to read what this is actually like especially with all the texture variation on there the that does remind me though that I actually got some good results from doing a little bit of texturing up front. First of all, I'm going to remove the like lines from the um, hot wire that I cut this with. doing this cutting, I'm trying to vary the angle that I'm cutting it in as well, because sometimes you end up with bad cut lines like this that look very, uh, just like unnaturally straight like that. But then sometimes you'll end up with lines that don't. I think the maybe the broader the blade is, the more you're gonna end up, end up with those very straight kind of lines. Whereas if you use a smaller one, you know, it's harder to get as much off at once, but I, I do think the uh, lines it leaves behind are more natural. 
Now I'm gonna follow some of the cues that came about just from like plopping these pieces on. So for instance, there's a piece like this sticking out. So I feel like that would come about because there's a significant fracture that runs by it, right? Um, and sometimes a fracture will go up to a, a line and then like shutter off in that direction. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that. So with that basic composition in mind, and maybe I'll pull another line down here because this is such a large feature sticking out there. It needs to be, needs to be justified somehow. I um, can start sort of squashing things around the big rock to get some texture going on there. And I think what I found from my last experiment doing it this way is that I found some faces that I did not expect to be like good the way they are. I thought I would have to do more cutting, but it turns out now nah, after you Hold this, or um, I lost my foil ball. Oh, there. Something as simple as a ball of foil over it. Uh, turns out looking okay. Sometimes good, sometimes great. But because this reference, again, is so just like crinkly and wrinkly, like it does look like <laughs> it's aluminum foil based. And now I can't get my aluminum foil ball up into this little area here because you know, it's got rounded corners. So that's why I have a variety of rocks that I've just collected around that have little little wedges so that I can get them into those kind of little crooks. This one right here being like, you know, I can fit that in almost anywhere. And then another thing that I was having some fun with was doing some smash in action. surface that way. Uh, but I'm still seeing some of those um, hot wire lines in there. So the nice thing is when you hit it with your hammer, you're fracturing it down into the foam. So as you, you know, like slice away the surface, you're still getting interesting fracture lines from it. You're not losing those. 
in the same way that you lose these like shallow knife slash, uh, slashes that I was doing before. thing that tends to look good is if you've got like a slash like I do here where it's just like a pretty thin line that travels all the way across just picking out an area or two and making it a little bit wider helps uh, to break up that line and you know just, I don't know it makes it a little more realistic problem here. I've got freeform air filling this gap and freeform air does not carve as the same way that um, the XPS foam does. It's a lot harder and so I could like try to dig it out. I could glue like a piece of foam over it um, or I can just live with it as a weird anomaly and I'm, I, I don't know. I'm experimenting. I'm on the fence about I want to approach that because rocks they do have anomalies aplenty general rule that I pick up from just examining reference and from various geology lectures I've watched on YouTube and from the learning company I, I think that when a chunk of rock flakes away like this and just like falls off the the surface behind that is usually smooth flat and like very discolored because it hasn't been exposed to the weathering and then decades or centuries later this area gets more and more pitted and stained the stain for obvious reasons the pitting because basically there's a, a bunch of mixed minerals in most rocks there's a lot of minerals mixed in there that erode uh, when exposed to air and water at different um, speeds and so the rock gets more pitted and granular as the, the longer it's exposed to weather. So it's basically protected by a little shield. The shield falls away and then over time it resumes the overall texture of the rest of the rock face. That's probably a very simplified uh, model but it, uh, it works as a simplified heuristic for art purposes.
And I've got these, what I think are overly straight lines. Let's get this a little more visible, maybe by standing it up. Yeah, easier to see that way. So, these lines, not happy with how straight they are, but I, I kind of like what they're doing, more or less. So, I'm just gonna sort of redirect parts of them. I'm getting some really nice just sort of randomization interesting lines going on in there get a little bit of texture going to think if I want to lean into this overhang or this one up here or both. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll let the foam decide. I'm just gonna sort of carve away at the surface and see where it naturally fractures. Thanks, last time, I think. Sorry, hard to see your name from all the way over here. Oh, speaking of which, it looks like we are over time. I got a meeting I need to get to, so let's find someone fun to raid. Out how we're doing here. I think we've got a good, um, a good start on rock pillar number two. Uh, it's not going to be a perfect match to rock pillar number one, but that's actually good. I'm, I'm wanting to improve uh, the direction that I'm going with the side. And again, rocks do all sorts of crazy things, so I don't feel bad about having different rock shapes on one side versus the other. All right, so Josh Foreman, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you like art and design like this, you should check it out. I also write fantasy novels. You should please uh, check those out on Amazon.
just just look at the look at the uh, user reviews. Decide for yourself uh, if it's something you might be interested in. And that's what I gotta say. Follow me on Instagram. All my links are there. See you guys next time. I'm just gonna chip at this for a couple minutes uh, until our raid kicks off.